A very good evening and welcome to the news tonight. I'm Tracy Shilji and in the next 30 minutes, I'll be getting you the day's top stories from India and across the world. Let's start with the headlines. Ahead of the budget session, Prime Minister Narendra Modi meets floor leaders of all parties, seeks their cooperation in the smooth functioning of parliament. Opposition leaders raise JNU sedition case controversy at their meeting with the Prime Minister. Journalists hold a protest in Delhi to demand action on the attack against their colleagues covering the case. Supreme Court gives RBI six weeks' time to submit details of companies that defaulted on loans of 500 crore and above, seeks names of institutions whose bad debts have been written off in the last five years. Supreme Court also declines Congress petition to maintain status quo in Arunachal Pradesh, refuses to stay formation of the new government in the state. And in our series on the expectations from the upcoming union budget, Finance Minister seems unlikely to raise income tax exemption limit this year. All that in a bit, but first, the government today assured opposition parties that it was willing to discuss all issues in the forthcoming budget session. At a meeting with floor leaders of major political parties, the Prime Minister sought their cooperation for the smooth running of Parliament. Opposition leaders, however, raised several concerns and issues, including the recent controversy in JNU. All political parties have said that some parties have said that they should go to the किसी परिस्थिति में सदन का गतिरोध नहीं होना चाहिए हम तो हमेशा इस मत के हैं कि बिल पास होने चाहिए कानून पास होने चाहिए और हर बिल मेरिट पे उसकी चर्चा होगी the government and the opposition speaking in one voice at the end of a two-hour long meeting of flow leaders of major political parties on Tuesday. But at the meeting convened by the Prime Minister, that was perhaps the only point of agreement, with both sides taking up divergent positions on the JNU controversy. The government stand is an inquiry is on, let the inquiry be completed. One. Secondly, these slogans or these posters are totally, highly objectionable. That has been made very clear. As far as the issues of uh, criticism of calling somebody this, somebody that, somebody calling anti-national, somebody calling uh, parochial, somebody calling communal and all, such things should be avoided by one and all. Here, JNU ke jo students union ke president hai, Kanahiya Kumar, unho ne koi bhi constitution ke khilaaf desh ke, ya desh ki ekta khandta ke khilaaf koi bhi aisi baat nahi betai hai, to unko sedition केस में बंद कर दिया गया है यह अनुचित लेकिन हमने यह भी बता दिया कि ऐसे लोग जो देश के खिलाफ है उनको हमारा कोई समर्थन नहीं कार्रवाई कर उनकी कार्रवाई कर दी जाए लेकिन साथ-साथ ही जिन्होंने दो साल से नेशनल एटमॉस्फेयर विशेड किया है उनके खिलाफ भी तो कार्रवाई होनी चाहिए with just a week to go for budget session, the Prime Minister assured the opposition that the government is willing to discuss all issues on the floor of the House, even as it sought their support in the smooth functioning of Parliament. Vishal Dahiya, Rajya Sabha TV, Delhi. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court has agreed to hear urgently hear a plea on the incident in the Patiala House court complex on Monday. Journalists who had gone to cover the JNU sedition case yesterday were manhandled by people dressed in lawyers' clothes, is what they're claiming. Their colleagues today came out in support, taking out a march uh, to the Supreme Court, shouting slogans and demanding action against the culprits. Meanwhile, the teachers at JNU also joined the students in boycotting classes at the university, vowing instead to hold classes on nationalism in the varsity lawns. In fact, talking about this, uh, as you can see, the uh, members, uh, journalists, community, of course, coming out today, uh, and walking all the way from the press club to the Supreme Court, uh, about 500 of them uh, being part of this march that took place. Uh, eventually, a few of them were allowed to go and uh, speak and hand over their petition as well. Um, and this, of course, taking place as yesterday, we did see outside the Patiala House Courts as journalists were covering the incident 
of, of course, the JNU Students Union uh, president, Kanhaya Kumar. His case was to come up, of course, and uh, as they were, of course, covering that incident, there were issues uh, that cropped up, and there were, of course, instances where journalists were roughed up by alleged lawyers. Meanwhile, of course, in JNU, the protests, of course, still on today. The teachers, in fact, boycotting uh, classes as well, uh, saying that they would, of course, hold uh, lectures on uh, nationalism, of course, in the varsity lawns. But as of uh, now, no classes, of course, being held in JNU, as, of course, the situation is getting even more tense uh, as the days go by, with the government sticking to its stand, saying that, of course, uh, uh, saying, in fact, that Kanhaya Kumar uh, did, of course, uh, you know, speak, uh, did, of course, support those anti-national slogans, uh, and the charges against him are still valid, and saying that the police did act as per its order. Journalists protesting outside the Supreme Court of India, shouting slogans, demanding action against the culprits who attacked media persons covering the hearing of the sedition case against JNU Students Union President Kanaiya Kumar. The scribes took out a march from the press club to the Supreme Court, raising slogans, supporting freedom of expression and against the alleged police action during the incident yesterday. There is this feeling of extreme fear today, you know, among people, extreme fear that if they speak out, if they say that is anything which is anti, uh, anti this government, they are going to be booked under the stringent laws of the land. And I think, uh, and, and this fear is also among, uh, among journalists today. A separate delegation of journalists met Home Minister Rajnath Singh demanding his intervention. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court has agreed to give an urgent hearing to a plea seeking action against those involved in the scuffle at Patiala House Court on Monday. The Apex Court agreed to hear the plea even as Delhi Police Commissioner B.S. Bassi said there were several contradictions in the case. Look, when we investigate any case, we have two kinds of evidence in that we have two kinds of evidence. We have two kinds of evidence. So, there are some evidence that is with any government agency. We also ask them to do it with them. At the Jawaharlal Nehru University, meanwhile, the teachers joined the students in boycotting classes to protest the arrest of Kanaya Kumar. The students went on an indefinite strike on Monday. The teachers now say they will take classes on nationalism in the university lawns. This prima facie, we have no reason to disbelieve any institution. But the fact of the matter is we will continue to stress that university administration must act in a non-partisan manner and not as a witch hunt. Even as the protests and hearings continue, the issue is alive in the political and academic circles too. Delhi Police Commissioner has told me that the case has been done in the case. The investigation is going on. The investigation is going on. The people who identify and identify the law will be done. The Delhi Police Commissioner wants to make the government's government in the form of the government. और उन्हीं की प्रवक्ता के रूप में जो सरकार कहती है वही बात बताएंगे लेकिन जो काम है उनका बुनियादी यहाँ पर कानून की व्यवस्था को बरकरार रखना अगर उसके अंदर फेल होते हैं तो आवाज उठेगी दे आर सप्रेसिंग द वॉइस ऑफ इंडियन स्टूडेंट्स वेदर इट इज इन दिल्ली इन हैदराबाद इन लखनऊ इन ऑल द यूनिवर्सिटीज अक्रॉस द कंट्री एंड वी विल नॉट एक्सेप्ट दिस वी विल फाइट दिस पीपल आर मोर देन वेलकम टू हैव देर ओपिनियन 
but they have no business imposing their opinion or crushing other people's viewpoint. But people just just think anything which is critical of the nation, critical of government decision, that's wrong. It's a very serious offence. And unless there is an element of insult to violence, no such Support also continues to flow in from around the world. Over 40 academicians from international universities, including Columbia, Yale, Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford, University of Toronto, King's College, University of California, Berkeley and New York University have expressed solidarity with JNU students, condemning the detention and suspension of students. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, we'll keep an eye out on developments on that front. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court today gave the RBI six weeks' time to submit details of all companies that had taken bad loans of 500 crore rupees or above and defaulted in repayment. The central bank has also been directed to include details of restructured assets and names of institutions whose bad debts have been written off in the last five years. A bench comprising Chief Justice T.S. Thakur sought to know how state-owned banks and financial institutions were advancing such huge loans without proper guidelines or an adequate loan recovery mechanism. The list will be submitted in the seal envelope after defence lawyers said that it would otherwise flout company confidentiality. The RBI is yet to give an official response to this order. Now, with the Supreme Court putting no hurdle in the formation of a new government in Arunachal Pradesh, the Union Cabinet may recommend revocation of the President's rule in the state soon. The Home Ministry is said to be waiting for a report from Governor J.P. Rajkoa about the latest political situation in the state. The Apex Court today refused to stay the formation of a new government in the state. This came a day after Congress dissident leader Kali Kopul claimed that he had enough support to be the state's new chief minister. The court also declined the Congress petition to maintain status quo in the state. Kul had stake claim to form the next government in the state yesterday. He claimed the support of 19 dissident Congress, 11 BJP and 2 independent MLAs. Now what is so hurry to uh, claim Proformation of government at this hour, where matter is pending before the court. They don't have any respect for our judiciary. They don't respect the law. They don't respect the constitution of India. Who is going to form the government? Congress or BJP? Collective of all political parties cannot form a government according to the 10th schedule. All right, now let's uh, talk uh, you through the by-elections for the 12 assembly seats in eight states. And the BJP, in fact, has sprung a major surprise in Uttar Pradesh with its candidate Kapil Dev Agarwal winning the riot-hit Muzaffarnagar seat. The Deoband seat went to the Congress, while the Samajwadi Party only managed to retain Bikapur in Faizabad. Remember, the three seats were earlier held by Mulayam's party. In Bihar, nearly three months after the RJD, JDU and Congress alliance came into power, the Grand Secular Alliance suffered a setback, losing the Harlaki Assembly by poll to the BJP ally Rashtriya Lok Samata Party candidate. In Punjab, the ruling Shiromani Akali Dal won the Khadur Sahib Assembly seat and uh, the Shiv Sena retained the Palghar Assembly seat near Mumbai. In Congress ruled Karnataka, the ruling party won Bidar seat, while the main opposition BJP won the Hebala and the Deva Durga seats. BJP also won the Mehar seat in Madhya Pradesh while the ruling TRS won the Narayan Ked Assembly seat. All right, now, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley will present his second full-year budget later this month. The salaried class has been hoping for income tax exemptions for a long time, but experts say that tax benefits for individuals look unlikely. Limited fiscal space may restrict the government from doling out any income tax benefits to individual payers. No relief appears to be in sight for taxpayers. The income tax exemption limit that was untouched in Union Budget 2015 is likely to stay intact in 2016 as well. But Finance Minister Arun Jaitley is proposing some respite for the salaried class. The measures include raising the deduction limit on health insurance premium from 15,000 rupees to 25,000 rupees, raising exemption on transport allowance from 800 rupees to 1600 rupees per month. The government claims it's staring at a difficult fiscal situation in 2016-17. For one, it has to shoulder an additional burden of nearly 1.10 lakh crore to implement the 7th Pay Commission report and the 1 lakh 1 pension scheme. 
Besides this, it needs to maintain fiscal deficit targets and boost public investments in infrastructure. At present, 2.5 to 5 lakh rupee income is taxed at 10%, 5 to 10 lakh rupees at 20%, and the 30% rate is levied on income above 10 lakh rupees. Given the fiscal situation and the roadmap for fiscal correction, if the finance minister is willing or, or is keen on sticking to it, he has really little scope to give any, you know, to make any cut in tax rates for individuals as such. The industry, however, expects Finance Minister Anun Jaitley to outline a clearer roadmap to cut corporate tax. In previous budget, Jaitley promised a 5% cut in corporate taxes over four years from 30% to 25% in a phased manner. Industry chambers suggest the withdrawal of incentives should be in line with a reduction in corporate tax. We believe the time has come and the way the industry and the world economy is performing. Indian economy is not immune to the world, what happens the world over. It's a golden opportunity. Now we should bring the tax rates in this budget itself to the 25% and make India more competitive with a competing economy. The finance minister also needs to find ways to double income taxpayers and broaden the tax net. Of the 125 crore population, roughly about 3.5 crore are in the income tax net. This pales in comparison to as many 39% taxpayers in Singapore, 46% in US and 75% in New Zealand. The government collected over 6,96,200 crore revenue in direct taxes in 2014-15. This is about 14% short of the projected target of 7,5,000 crore. Kriti Mishra's report for Rajya Sabha TV. All right, away from the protests and, of course, the politics and budget concerns, the nine brave hearts who lost their lives in Siachen fighting for the country were laid to rest today at their respective hometowns. They were killed when an avalanche hit their post on the 3rd of February. Here's a report. 21 gun salutes floral tributes and tears. An atmosphere filled with inspiration and patriotism. This is how the nation bid a final adieu to the nine Siachen soldiers in their respective hometowns. Thousands of people bid a tearful goodbye to Sipoy Sunil Suryavanshi at his native Maskarwadi village in Maharashtra's Satara district. The soldier was cremated with full military honours amid chants of Shaheed Sunil Suryavanshi Amar Rahe. In the southern city of Mysuru, teary eyed people gathered at the government guest house to pay homage to Sipoy Mahesha PN. Several dignitaries, including the Karnataka chief minister and the mayor of the city, were also present. Homage was also paid to Havildar Elumalai M in his hometown of Vellore on Tuesday morning. Officials of the Indian Coast Guard Eastern Region and fellow members of the ICG and state government representatives laid wreaths and paid homage. Deceased Jawan Sepoy Mushtaq Ahmed was laid to rest in Kurnool district. Andhra Pradesh Deputy Chief Minister K. E. Krishnamurti and leaders from various political parties paid homage to the Jawan before the burial was performed. Scores of villagers also turned up at the funeral and paid their last respects to the deceased soldier. The state also announced ex gratia of 25 lakh rupees to the family of Sepoy Ahmad. The others killed in the avalanche were Lance Naik Sudhish of Kollam district in Kerala and Sepoy Ganeshan from Madurai. They were also laid to rest at their respective hometowns. Without a quick break here, we'll be back with more news in just a bit. Stay with us. Tales that inspire. Stories of social change. A salute to diversity. Promoting public discourse. Events that motivate. Inspiring the innovative spirit. Watch Rajya Sabha television documentaries. Mondays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays at 10.30pm.
Welcome back. Let's get to some international news now. And U.S. President Barack Obama today called upon leaders from Southeast Asia to strengthen trade ties and form a common stance on the South China Sea issue. The White House hopes that this will solidify its influence in the region. At the two-day meeting of leaders of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, President Barack Obama underlined his personal commitment to build a strong and long-lasting alliance. At the opening session of the summit in California, Obama called for a strong and enduring partnership. And here at the summit, we can reaffirm that strong, prosperous and inclusive societies require good governance, rule of law, accountable institutions, vibrant civil societies and upholding human rights. Obama, who leaves office next year, has championed a foreign policy pivot to Asia during his presidency and is determined to present the United States as a Pacific power. The U.S. is now the largest investor in ASEAN and its fourth largest trading partner. This reflects my personal commitment and the national commitment of the United States to a strong and enduring partnership with your ten nations. The summit is the first between the U.S. and the ten-nation ASEAN bloc on American soil. On Tuesday, the leaders will discuss regional security issues. They include counter-terrorism and China's territorial claims on disputed waters of the South China Sea, moves that sounded international alarm and heightened tensions. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha Television. Meanwhile, China is supporting tougher UN sanctions against Pyongyang to curb its nuclear program. Chinese Vice Foreign Minister Zhang Yisui also held a meeting with South Korean counterpart Lim Sung Nam in Seoul on Tuesday amid heightened tensions in the Korean Peninsula. At the start of the year, North Korea successfully conducted a hydrogen bomb test and launched a rocket on the 7th of February, which the US and other Western countries have called a ballistic missile test. Since then, tensions have been on the, on the rise in the Korean Peninsula. We at least 50 people were killed in airstrikes on hospitals and schools in northern Syria on Monday. The UN has called it a blatant violation of international law while Turkey and Russia played the blame game over the horrific attacks. The carnage continues in North Syria. On Monday, missiles hit five medical centers and two schools in rebel-held towns. The targets including a Doctors Without Borders hospital. Hey. Azar's town, the last rebel stronghold on the Turkish border, also came under attack. The missiles slammed into a school sheltering families. Again, a deliberate attack, attack against uh, medical structure. It's clearly an attack uh, against the medical uh, mission. The UN called it a blatant violation of international law. UN envoy to Syria, Stefan de Mistura, arrived unannounced in Damascus on Monday. He is expected to hold talks with the Syrian foreign minister later tonight. Meanwhile, the European Union said it had plans to establish a humanitarian aids office in Damascus. France called it a war crime. To the hospital of Médecins Sans Frontières is completely unacceptable. And we will continue to pressure all the parties to respect the basic principles of humanitarian law. Meanwhile, Turkey continued to shell Kurdish positions for the third day to stop them from seizing the town of Azaz. The standoff between Russia and Turkey only increased the risk of direct confrontation between Russia and the NATO member. Munich'te varılan anlaşmaya rağmen bu açıklamanın yapılması da açık bir şekilde Rusya'nın niyetinin ateşkes ya da barış değil, daha çok sivil öldürerek, daha çok katliam yaparak Taking pot shots at Turkey and Saudi Arabia, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad said ceasefire should create stability. He also urged Syrians to stay back as the migrant crisis has blown out of proportion. Come 
The only ray of hope for Syria now is an immediate ceasefire. Until the world leaders move towards a real cessation of hostilities, the fate of ordinary Syrians hangs in the balance. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. With that, let's take you through some more international news updates in Global Buzz. Two Indian students were killed in a fire at a Russian university on Sunday. The fire broke out on the fourth floor of the dormitory of the Medical Academy. Two students from Maharashtra, Pooja Kalur and Karishma Bosley, were killed in their sleep. Both were fourth-year medicine students. Two Chinese men appeared at a Thai court today and denied all charges against them. Both were accused of involvement in a bombing that killed 20 people in Bangkok last year. More than 120 were wounded by the blast at the shrine, a popular attraction for both tourists and Thais alike. Tensions are running high in Uganda ahead of Thursday's presidential election. The Ugandan opposition leader was arrested as violence broke out on the streets. Police forces fired tear gas and rubber bullets to break up a crowd of opposition supporters. All political parties are expected to stage final rallies today. At least four people were killed when a powerful gas explosion destroyed part of an apartment block in Russia early on Tuesday. At least 39 people are reportedly still trapped under the rubble. Preliminary investigations reveal that the explosion was caused by a gas leak. And finally, let's get you all the latest from the world of sports in Sportsbeat. India will play West Indies and South Africa in their two warm-up matches in the run-up to the ICC World 2020 in India next month. The men in blue will play West Indies at Eden Gardens in Kolkata on the 10th of March, followed by a match against the Proteas in Mumbai on the 12th. Five-time world champion Vishwanathan Anand played out two draws to keep his full-point lead in the Zurich Chess Challenge. After wins against Levon Aronian and Anish Giri, Anand drew with Latvian Alexei Shirov in the third round game, followed by a draw with Hikaru Nakamura of the United States in the classical rapid section. Venus Williams beat Misaki Doi 6-4, 6-2 to win the inaugural Taiwan Open. Williams overcame the Japanese player to claim the 49th title of a 21-year professional career. Williams' latest victory leaves her seventh on the all-time list of tournament wins in women's singles. Disgraced FIFA president Sepp Blatter returned to the headquarters of soccer's world governing body today. His appeal against an eight-year ban from the sport was heard. Sepp Blatter appeared before a hearing to appeal against his suspension from the sport at the headquarters of the soccer's governing body. English side Chelsea will meet Paris Saint-Germain in the last 16 of the Champions League. Chelsea will miss captain and defender John Terry though. PSG's Zlatan Ibramovic and Diego Silva will return after rest. The two teams have been drawn together in the Champions League knockout phase for the third successive season with both winning one each in the last two encounters. And that's all we have for you on the news tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.